my slides at least. Emma, I'll just give a quick one second intro to you. Um, okay. If you're ready. So I've mentioned this to many, I think, in the audience that open space is the software we use at planetariums. And Emma has developed this tool you're about to see. Anybody that's interested in this, please come talk to me, Slack Emma after. We're looking for feedback on this. I'd really love to see people get excited about this kind of visualization tool. And for those online, please do the same. Emma has done an amazing thing in getting this tool um, ready. I hope I'm not hyping it too, too much before you actually see it. Uh, but that's the intro that I wanted to give. And I'm very, very excited for you to give scientific feedback on what you would like to see come out of this tool after you see it. Okay. All right, Emma, let's hope. Let's hope this all transfers. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot for that introduction, Jackie. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm a, a research engineer at Lean Sheffield University within the area of scientific visualization. And for the last, yeah, for a while now, I've been working on uh, an interactive visualization tool for exoplanet experts. And this is very much an ongoing work. So as Jackie mentioned, uh, any feedback at all is uh, really appreciated. Um, but first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about, because I'm also a, a software developer for the software open space. And this tool is built very much on top of the open space software. So let me just give you a brief uh, introduction to the software before I show you the tool, which Jackie might have overhyped, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, so open space is a 3D visualization tool uh, that contextualizes data from space missions, observations, simulations. Um, there are renderings of planetary surfaces, uh, space weather simulations, exoplanets, highly relevant if you're going to talk about today, and yeah, basically the entire observable universe put into one big 3D engine. Um, it runs on anything from dome theaters, as Jackie said, it's used in planetariums, um, and to, yeah, and on laptops. Uh, and it relies very heavily on interaction. It's a, it's a really interactive software. You can interact with the data in real time uh, and sort of explore and explain what you're seeing. So it's used for science communication within planetariums, museums, um, and we're trying to make more and more an effort of making it useful for research. And this, this tool that I'm going to show you is one of our ongoing efforts for that, and also the uh, Glue open space integration that I believe Jackie mentioned a bit during the hands-on session yesterday. Um, and best of all, it's completely open source. Uh, all of the source code is on GitHub, uh, freely accessible to anyone. Um, so yeah, uh, open space is a collaboration between a few different institutions. Uh, and the top one here is represents Linköping University, or rather the campus in Norrköping, Sweden. Uh, which I'm stationed. And this picture shows our uh, beautiful industrial landscape with the visualization center. But I also have colleagues from um, the Ski Institute in, at the University of Utah, American Museum of Natural History in New York, NYU, and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington, DC. So uh, the tool has the working name, the Exoplanet Explorer. And the aim is to simplify the exploration of uh, exoplanet data for experts or uh, people that know a bit about uh, this kind of data. You, and we want to do this using visualization methods, filtering, interaction, um, and using the powers of open space to contextualize their data in 3D. Uh, so yeah, it's powered by open space. It's built on top of open space. Um, and it's very much an ongoing research work. Uh, and we try to collaborate with experts to get input on the tool. So our next step is uh, to get more input on uh, how how can this kind of tool be useful within research, and what can we do to make it useful. Uh, so what I'm going to show you today is the first prototype, and for this we have combined data from a few different uh, data sources, uh, and this is done in a pre-processing step. So basically, all the user has to do is to run a Python script, and it uh, fetches the latest data from the NASA Exoplanet Archive, a few uh, stellar middle latest city abundances data sets. Um, this is, there, there's more work to be done here, uh, particularly when it comes to the new Gaia release, to get data from that in there. 
Um, and we also have a small data set of detected molecules in exoplanet atmospheres that we've sort of included. Um, but this can be basically whatever else. Uh, the, since since it's, the data processing is driven by passion, I kind of expect that the experts uh, might put whatever data they want in, into there and be able to analyze it the way they want in the tool. Uh, so before I jump into it, I just want to show you a quick guide to some the first thing that you're going to see. Uh, and that is that we represent each planet by a ring to be able to show multiple planets in one position. So a multi-planet system is represented this way, with where each ring represents a planet in the system. And the radius of the ring uh, corresponds to the component of the planet, B, C, D, E, etc. And single planet systems will look something like this. Um, so with that, I'm going to get right to it. I'm going to stop my sharing for a second and switch over to another screen. Um, there we go. OK. It's very quiet, and I can't see anyone. So if I, someone could just verify that you're seeing rings in different colors moving around on the screen. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, right, so this is the view you get. And what we're seeing here is uh, the 3D view of open space, but on a 2D monitor. So I can zoom in and out. Uh, I, my focus right now is Earth. So I'm rotating around the Earth. And here we can see the Milky Way popping up in the background. And each of these rings is um, an exoplanet. And right now, we're showing basically all of the 5,000 exoplanets that was in the exoplanet archive when I ran my data preparation script. Um, it's very cluttered. There's a lot of things going on here. We get a sort of an overview of what we're seeing. We have some visual cues, a line that goes to the Milky Way Center here, and also the Kepler field of view. And the uh, rings are colored based on uh, whatever value we want, really. But right now, it's uh, an emission spectroscopy met metric uh, that sort of gives a a value on how suitable the planet is for emission spectroscopy studies. Um, and yeah, we have a table that shows uh, the current selection. Right now, all of the 5,089 planets. And this one is sortable, interactive. We can move around, select uh, columns, etc. But usually, we want, I bet you want to move with a, yeah, work with a slightly smaller sample. Um, so what we can start doing is start filtering this data. And I start with what I call internal filters here, uh, which is filtering within the open space software. Uh, so here we basically are represented with two different parts. The first one is uh, a place where we can filter based on any column that we want. Uh, so here I can select whatever column. The default one is name. I could, for example, say, show me only the Kepler planets. And the view is updated. Uh, to show only the Kepler ones. Can remove it. Um, let's, for example, say we want to look at the close, closest planet. So we pick the one which has a distance smaller than 100 parsec, let's say. It gives us a nice little sphere of exoplanets. Um, a lot of gray ones. And gray means that we don't have a value for that uh, specific uh, parameter that we've chosen to color our planets by. Uh, but that's fine for now. Uh, the other part of this filter UI is some quick access filters that can be used to just quickly sort of investigate what kind of planets am I looking at. I can, for example, remove the radial velocity planets, uh, but remove most of the gray ones, because the parameters we use to compute this emission spectroscopy metrics don't exist for most radial velocity planets. Um, and I can also, for example, select just something with yeah, a predefined filter for terrestrial planets that, were, that has been added. So now we see all the terrestrial planets with an Earth radial radii smaller than 1.5 um, within 100 parsec. Uh, yeah, let's remove the radial velocity ones. Uh, so this is one example of how you can sort of interact with the data uh, and explore 
what we have in there, you can filter and combine. And we can also change the color mapping from another menu here. Uh, so here, as I said, right now it's selected, uh, colored by the emission spectroscopy metric, but I can change that to whatever, for example, the equilibrium temperature. And using this button, I can map that to the current range I have in my, in my data set. Um, you can also update the visuals, change the size of the glyphs, uh, this, these rings, um, et cetera. Uh, if I move these a bit. Emma, one thing just for everybody here and probably online, it's a little jumpy and that has nothing to do with the software right now. That's everything to do with Zoom. Right now on mm -hmm. Emma's screen, it's very fluid. You're flying naturally. You wouldn't see this like hiccup thing, but it's Zoom. Uh is not very good for sharing this tool, yeah. just FYI. Yeah, that, because you can probably see I have a frame rate of about 350 <laughs> right now, but that's probably an open zoom it's bringing through. So I'm going to try to move around, not quite as much. Um, anyhow, so something we built with this tool is also that we can we have combined it with uh, the existing exoplanet visualizations within open space. Uh, so for example, if I select a system that has a few different planets, such as the trapez one system, which everyone is familiar with, um, I can also add a visual representation of the orbit parameters for that system and focus it. And now if I zoom in, I'm going to try to not zoom as fast then, uh, that will take me to a system specific view with orbital parameters visualized. Um, and this, this one is shipped with the original software. So that one everyone can just add and look at. Um, but our idea is to also extend uh, this view, depending on what, what could be interesting to see for specific planets. Um, here we at see, anyhow, we see um, uh, a visualization of the habitable zone, the orbits, uh, and also this disk here, that I hope comes across over Zoom uh, is, uh, shows the uncertainty of the semi-major axis for each of the orbits as well. Uh, and if we would turn on the simulation time, we'd also see them move. Uh, that was probably most of the open space things. Uh, so uh, something I want to show you in addition to this, is a separate web page that we built to accompany uh, this tool. Uh, and to sort of try to apply uh, more traditional visualization methods to this kind of data. Uh, and one last and note before you move on from open space here, Emma, too, is that this is fully integrated with the digital um, universe atlas that we curate very carefully at yes. the American Museum of Natural History. So you can, for instance, turn on open clusters, turn on other aspects of Gaia discoveries that are very exciting. If you want to really contextualize where your planets are, there Emma goes turning on the open clusters. If you're like, ah, where are all these planets? Maybe it's in a cluster. You can very quickly and easily move through curated catalog data sets in order to make extra discoveries on what's more of a standard exoplanet kind of approach to doing science. And there's a ton more in that. We don't have to go over that, but just so everybody knows, we have curated catalogs of data that we insert into this software. Exactly. Uh, the software is also very modular. Uh, so if you have a little bit of knowledge, you can create your own assets out of your data sets and put them into open space in real time. Um, so just like when you're looking at the data, put in something else. Uh, that requires a bit of a bit of open space knowledge, we like to call it, but but it's definitely doable and something that I know Jackie does in her research quite a bit. And and we carefully always curate this with Gaia. Gaia is the ground base now for all of our modeling of where to place all of these structures. So everything now has its Gaia distance, as long as it has a Gaia distance and a well curated Gaia distance will be used in this software. So uh, just as a final note, I just want to show that you this uh, separate web page. It's very much a work in progress. Uh, 
and it's accessible through this tab over here, but I've already prepared a little. So there. And what I can do here is that I can fetch the data from open space. And I'm going to talk about this view in the center mostly, uh, because that's the visualization part of this. Uh, so what we're seeing here is a parallel coordinates plots, uh, where each vertical axis uh, represents one uh, dimension in the data set. And here I've chosen the discovery method, the radius of the planet, the mass of the planet, and the equilibrium temperature. Uh, and each of the lines to sort of cross these vertical lines represents a planet. Uh, so that way we can sort of quickly see that this planet, uh, it's a transit planet, and it has a radius of about 23 Earth radii, because that's where it cross intersects uh, the, the Earth, uh, the radius axis. Uh, and it has a mass of about 1,000 Earth masses and uh, equilibrium temperature of little over 1,400 Kelvin. Um, this one is also interactive. So we can filter uh, these lines to only show uh, planets that we're interested in. So for example, if I click and drag on this axis here, I can create a box that uh, acts as a filter on the line that passes through the axis. So now I've selected only the transit planets. And if I move this up, I can select only the imaging planets, et cetera. And this selection can then be sent back to open space. And you can do this kind of interaction back and forth. Um, this bottom point here, the lower axis, represents missing values. So we can see that, for example, uh, this planet here, uh, Kepler-37e, it doesn't have any value for the radius, mass, or equilibrium temperature. Um, and this web page is also kind of customizable. You can select what axis you want to include. So if I use this setting here, I can sort of add stellar mass, for example, or stellar density. And then they also show up as um, axis. And I can filter, cross filter over different axes as well. So I can say transit planets with stellar density of less than 20, for example. And that gives me that selection of planets. And if I hover over the yeah, over the table here, it shows me that specific planet in the view. Uh, but I think I'm going to stop there and leave uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, is, let me get back to my presentation really quick. Uh, before I move on to questions, I just want to uh, show this slide really quick. Um, if you want to know more about the open space software, I didn't have time to show you very much of the software itself today, but I've heard that you're going to probably see a bit more of it tomorrow uh, from one of Jackie's presentations. Uh, but here's a reference to a paper on the software and also a tag to our social medias and uh, our web page in case you want to learn more. And the best place, if you're interested, is probably also the GitHub page. Just search open space on GitHub. Um, and yeah, thank you. Any questions? So we have a couple questions for Emma online. Um, uh, from Aki uh, Roberge, uh, will the tool output the results of a filtering exercise, like a list of systems that passed all your filters? And uh, it can. <laughs> I'm adding that, writing that down now. Um, it's just a matter of, of writing the resulting filter to a, to a text file. So sure, sure. Um, it's not something that's completely doable now, but it's a good, good suggestion. And also information about the filters then, probably. I, uh, is the answer yes? <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> it, it will. It will, OK. Yeah. Uh, let's take one question from in the room. Hi. Hi. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the overview. A uh, really nice tool. Um, I actually delivered um, shows at the Greenwich uh, Planetarium in the weekends. Uh, so I would be really excited to try and incorporate this tool to, to um, our planetarium in London. Um, just have maybe a quick a couple of questions. How would you, um, how is it synchronized with the exoplanet databases? Uh, because now we know that there's probably going to be much more planets coming on. 
and also are there any prospects of having some sort of artistic representations uh, of some of these systems that we could incorporate and, and share open source that would be really cool um i, th I think for for the uh, visitors to see some of this uh, what we think these systems may may look like that's a that's a really good uh, that's a really good question uh so regarding the artistic uh, uh, impressions we with the open space software we only ship uh, like what we consider real data uh, we have the policy of showing only data that exists but but it's as i said you can basically add whatever data that you want in here so if for showing uh, artistic impression impressions in a planetarium uh, we could definitely help or it's it's completely possible to add uh, contents that to show these uh, impressions on the planet surfaces and could you remind me of the, the first part of your question? How is it synchronized with the exoplanet database with a right. database? Yeah. Uh, so currently, we need a pre-processing step uh, to get this data. And that's because we do uh, some, some reformatting of the data set to get that into this, this format that open space reads. Um, but for this exoplanet tool, that I built on top of open space, uh, the, the only thing you need to do is run a Python script. And our, our, we have thoughts on, on streamlining this process further on for the, uh, the three-dimensional visualizations of the exoplanet systems. That is on our pipeline to, to sort of update the data automatically when you, when you start the software, which is how most of our, um, our data is loaded. Okay, unfortunately, we're gonna to have to uh, stop it there. So uh, let's give Emma a hand again.